Harvard Divinity School. Tangled Souls, Hidden Voices, Women and Dissident Networks in the Late Middle Ages, October 7th, 2021. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our Zoom audience for our first lecture of the season from the Women's Studies and Religion program at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome all. Um, it's really wonderful to have our research associates on campus this semester, uh, which we haven't had for quite some time, but uh, still to be able to join with all of you remotely for this afternoon's lecture from uh, Dr. Delphine, excuse me, Dr. Delphi Nieto Isabel. Um, Delphi uh, has come to us from Spain, where she is an associate researcher at the Institute for Research on Medieval Culture at the University of Barcelona. And um, we were so fortunate, there was a lot of competition to get her this year. Um, we were competing with the Marie Curie Fellowship, which is the most prestigious fellowship awarded by the European Commission for research in the humanities, um, but they agreed to defer a year so that Delphi could begin her important research here uh, with us. Um, just a few housekeeping details before I mention the research that she will be speaking about today. Just a few other words about Delphi's research before I give her the mic. Um, her, she, Delphi has been doing research applying social network analysis to the study of medieval Christianity uh, for more than 10 years, beginning in 2013. And um, I just want to make a shout out to our Dean David Hampton, who is currently at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland delivering the Gifford lectures using the application of social network analysis to the study of Christianity. Um, he started that a little later than Delphi, but um, uh, I commend his lectures to you. It's really an important new approach to this, this field um, that I know you will all want to, to avail yourselves of. Um, Delphi has recently, very recently, co-authored a volume on Christianity and digital humanities. Uh, it was just published about a week ago. Um, but it will it does connect with the lecture that she will be delivering today. And if any of you um, have questions about it or getting access to that uh, volume, um, she'll be happy to to respond to those queries. Um, let me pass you the virtual microphone. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm as ready as I'll ever be, so uh, let's do this. Uh, it's really good to see some of you, some familiar faces there. Um, I would thank you, Anne, for that introduction. Um, I've just co-authored a chapter in the volume, I should say, but uh, thank you for that. And thank you all for being here, um, especially those of you who are joining us from overseas. I'm well aware that this is a bit late in the day for, for you, so I'll try to make this as painless and as possible. <laughs> so um, with anything else uh, on the matter to say, let's move on to the share screen thing. Wait a second, that was a spoiler alert. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I wanted to start by saying that um, um, it took me a while to decide on which part of my research to, to base this whole talk. And finally, I decided that probably the best thing I could do was to share with you what has been sort of the guiding premise uh, in the work I'm uh, conducting here at the Women's um, Studies in Religion program, and what will also be a major question in the project I'll be undertaking next year at Queen Mary in London. And that is that the role, the contribution of women to dissident religious movements in the Middle Ages has been underestimated both quantitatively and qualitatively, basically because of the fact that we uh, base it or we do research based on sources that are fundamentally biased. And that bias has specially uh, or is specially damaging to women. So this is sort of the point I'm gonna try to make over the following minutes. And I'm really looking forward to a Q&A to, to see whether I've managed to do just that. 
So I'll start by, um, uh, well, with uh, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors. It says, fear is a strange soil. Mainly, it grows obedience like corn, which grows in straight lines to make weeding easier. But sometimes it grows the potatoes of defiance, which flourish on the ground. So um, I guess I work on those potatoes of defiance and particularly on the people who planted them and the people who were trying to weed them out. Actually, at some point, I think I even considered naming my project Potatoes of Defiance, but it was like a bit too much. So I settled for Networks of Defiance, which has the added merit of combining like the two pillars of my whole research. That is on the one hand networks, which I'll be discussing extensively um, during the talk, and on the other, defiance. So why defiance? Why not a more commonly used words such as heresy? So um, I think, and I'd like to discuss this later, that heresy is a notion that has become a bit stale, basically because it's a deceptively clear cut concept. Um, insofar as it is a crime defined in canon law as straying away from dogma and doing so very publicly. So the fact that dogma is included in that definition means that heresy is uh, inevitably linked to its twin notion of orthodoxy and also uh, deceptively clear cut. And together they form this sort of very unhelpful binary which could lead someone to believe that every religious expression has to fit either in one category or in the other. But as we know, and many in the audience that the faces I recognize know very well, um, it is not true that the very rich variety of religious expressions in, in the medieval uh, period um, fit either. Many of them didn't, simply didn't, or changed their category overnight. So that's why uh, I think that um, from the late 90s, especially in non-English speaking scholarship, we found this tendency to uh, shift towards more nuanced terms, such as the, uh, sorry, dissidents or dissent, religious dissent. And that's a tendency that has also reached the English speaking world. And um, that's why this defiance sort of, uh, I thought was a good idea to use it as an umbrella term that could encompass all these notions. Plus, defiance also had another nuance, and that is the nuance of disobedience, which is necessary for defiance. And since disobedience was a big thing in the definition of heresy uh, from the second half of the 13th century and into the 14th, roughly, uh, it sort of worked. The thing is that uh, whatever word we choose to describe this context, um, most of us who work in this field need to rely at one time or another, sometimes mainly, even uh, although not only, but mainly, in inquisitorial sources. So uh, when I say inquisitorial sources, I'm talking about sources that resulted, that were created as a result of the inquisitorial process conducted by inquisitors. And I'm being so careful about these terms because uh, when we talk about the Middle Ages, um, we need to recall that when we say inquisition, we are not referring to inquisition with capital I as this sort of very well organized hierarchical uh, institution, but rather we are talking about the inquisitio, that is the, the method of judicial inquiry, which is exactly what inquisitio, inquisitio means, conducted by men that were called inquisitores, that's inquisitors. So um, the sources you see on screen, uh, which are the sources I'm basically using right now for this project uh, are late, uh, well, early 14th century sources. But the inquisitors by then had behind them almost a century long tradition of how to effectively um, fight heresy using this method of inquisitio. Um, even the inquisitors, the early inquisitors that were appointed from the 1230s onwards uh, and when we're bringing into the table this sort of uh, new effective method, this inquisitio, and there's loads of literature on how the inquisitio appears and then it's used against heresy, I won't go into that. But um, even these early inquisitors were also inheriting something else. They were inheriting a centuries long tradition, a two and a half century long tradition, if you will, uh, of how to fight heresy in the sense of what heresy meant. 
I'm talking about bishops, I'm talking about then Cistercian monks uh, fighting heresy and from the late 10th to the early 11th uh, in rough terms. So um, basically in those old times, uh, the heresy uh, thing always followed sort of the same pattern or at least that's what they saw. Uh, a man would come into town, the man would usually be a literate, that meant he knew Latin and he had received some sort of clerical training and he came into town um, basically spouting all sorts of heretical errors. Of course, the mass, that is the population, both men and women, gullible, immediately followed along this wolf in sheep's clothing, which was one of the biblical phrases that appeared all over the period in this kind of sources. Um, and then these people were led astray from the fault uh, for the Christian, from the proper Christian fault. So for this um, ecclesiastical authorities, the solution was pretty clear. You just needed to cut off the serpent's head and I'm done with the animal metaphors for a while. Um, and once this man, the, the heresiarchs, that is the master of heretics, as they are called, were removed from the equation, then the population was free to be back to being good Christians. That was sort of thing. So that is, uh, if there ever was one, a leadership narrative. And apart from the problem that it basically thinks that uh, or posits that this whole community of lay people had mm, no agency whatsoever and they simply followed along. Apart from that, the thing is that it's not only a model of or, or a narrative of leadership, it is a male leadership narrative because these men that were a single doubt that needed to be removed from the fold and that were sort of the guilty part, uh, that were responsible for leading everybody astray, were always, with very, very few exceptions, and I can think of one, and I'll talk about her a bit later, but um, basically men. So uh, this is something that early inquisitors inherited and combined with their uh, new method of the inquisitio. So um, how does, this um, leadership a narrative affect the process and the sources the process generated. Well, the thing is that to uh, understand that it is very useful to, to understand how the process worked, but also to compare it. And that was sort of the central point in this chapter um, and mentioned at the beginning. Uh, it is useful to compare the whole inquisitorial process to a modern method of sociological inquiry that is called snowball sampling. Uh, why this one? Well, the snowball sampling is useful and currently because it's helpful to uncover what is known as hidden populations. That is people who don't want to be found out. People who for different reasons are unregistered or have a clandestine component or are difficult to identify. So that's exactly the definition of these uh, dissident networks I'm talking about for starters. But there are also other points in common, precisely how the, the whole thing works. So I, I prepared this very little um, picture. I, I hope you'll enjoy that. Because basically we have our, uh, I'm not saying of course that inquisitors were social scientists, not at all. I'm just saying that it's youth, useful to make the comparison because it can shed some light on the limitations of the whole process. So we have this inquisitor, this little Dominican here, and uh, he would address the whole thing by interrogating people. He would find some people and would ask them about the matter of heresy. Uh, what do you know about heresy? Uh, who do you know that belongs to this group of heretics? What kind of connection do you have to them? And so these people being interrogated would start saying names. And then uh, the process will basically go on so that in the end, uh, some people were mentioned several times, some people were mentioned just the once. But the thing is, the idea is that starting with very few individuals, the inquisitor could then reach the whole uh, dissident network. So far, so good, because um, I'm not talking about a gender bias here. So that's, uh, that should have worked. But how is it that uh, this thing introduced a gender bias? Well, and, and to prove that, I'm gonna, if you uh, indulge me, I'm gonna conduct a very simple experiment that I hope you will uh, help me uh, conduct. So I'm gonna ask all of you a very simple question and I would really appreciate it if you could answer that question using the chat tool. 
uh, you just need to answer with the first thing that comes to mind once you see the question. I'll give you like a minute to, to write down your answers. So the question is as follows. Name your favorite fiction author. No constraints whatsoever. So whatever comes to mind. Okay, we're seeing a few here. Livia Butler, Ursula Le Guin, Toni Morrison, Laurie King, Jasper Forde, uh, Kiamanda Nozie Adikie. Sorry, Rahina, I'm probably pronouncing that poorly. Banana Yoshimoto, Richard Russo. Okay. Okay. So now that we've done that, let's go to the second part of the experiment. And I'm gonna pose another question to you, but this time along, it will be a poll. So you'll see appear on your screen, a sort of poll window. You just have to answer that question. Um, please choose one of the options, even if you don't like any of them, but please do that for me to, to sort of prove my whole point. So this is the question. Among the following fiction authors, who is your favorite? So I'm gonna launch the poll. So um, I'm going to share the results with you. So now uh, to continue with the experiment, let us imagine that uh, something awful happens, a massive disaster, and everything is lost of our society. And 100 years from now, the only thing remaining are the reports for these two questions. And let us imagine that two historians find these reports. So historian one finds the first one. And so uh, the report says, my favorite fiction author is. And then um, historian one sees a variety of people, a variety of gender, a variety of, rage, uh, of race, a variety of origins, a variety of languages. But then uh, historian two is very unlucky and just has this report. My favorite fiction authors are, without the question, mind you, uh, my favorite fictions are Dan Brown, Neil Gaiman, Philip K. Dick, Noah Gordon, Stephen King. So uh, the conclusion that Historian 2 would reach, and rightly so, uh, on the basis of their sources, would be that the favorite fiction authors in the early 20, uh, 21st century were all born in the 20th century, were all men, were all white, and were all English-speaking authors. Of course, those conclusions would be awfully wrong. That historian number two wouldn't know because uh, historian number two he hasn't seen the question, hasn't seen that there was a prompt in the question, only the results. So I'm guessing by now you all see where I'm going with this. The thing is that, um, I'm closing the poll. The thing is that the inquisitorial bias was introduced because to this is inquisitorial is no sampling. The key issue was uh, how were the questions formulated? And the questions weren't always open-ended questions. On the contrary, many names were introduced by the inquisitors themselves into the question list. The inquisitors who were following this male leadership narrative I was uh, talking about a minute ago. So that meant that some people slowly became, became what I'd like to call uh, heresy markers. Knowing them actually, um, uh, immediately, sorry, made you uh, suspicious of heresy. And talking to them, eating with them, traveling with them were questions that were actually introduced as such in the question list uh, posed by inquisitors during interrogation. So of course, when we read the records, we find lots more of names uh, related to these heresy markers than to um, other people. But on top of that, those heresy markers, as I said, with a very special exception, were always men. That means that inquisitors were not expecting female leadership among dissident movements, and therefore did not ask for female leadership in the lists of questions. So um, is there anything we can do about this? Um, or in other words, uh, is there on, any other way to see whether what I'm saying is actually accurate? Where my answer to that, of course, is that it is, and that is uh, the approach, the, what I like to call the relational approach. That is uh, the approach that uses uh, social networks. A social network is a very simple thing. It's based mostly on two uh, components. Those are actors or nodes and edges or relations. 
An actor can be anything you want it to be, from books to buildings to countries to anything else. But since I'm uh, working on religious networks, of course, for me, the actors are uh, people and the relations uh, established between them. And these relations can be, again, anything you can think of from friendship, uh, simple acquaintanceship to hate even, but also giving money, giving shelter um, and sharing ideas. That's also a relation. So the third component in, in social network analysis and historical network analysis in particular are uh, centrality measures. What are centrality measures? And I've uh, simply used here four. I won't talk about them all. I just wanted them to, to be on screen. Centrality measures are exactly what they say, are a measure of how central you are in your network. Um, why different measures? Because you can be central to your network in very different ways. So I'm basically gonna focus on the first two degree and eigenvector centrality because I think that will be more useful to, to prove or to make my point. The first one, uh, degree centrality, means simply to how many people are you connected in any which way. For example, if this is an acquaintanceship network, how many people are you acquainted with uh, among the audience? Okay, so in inquisitorial records, that would mean how many people uh, did you mention in your deposition or how many people mentioned you in their own deposition when questioned by the inquisitor? So in a way, this degree centrality is uh, the easiest approach to the whole network thing, but it's also, uh, very much like a more conventional approach to the sources. You would read the record and you'd start identifying people and saying, okay, this man here is mentioned 20 times. That probably means that he was very important to his network. And look, this woman here was just mentioned twice. That means that probably she wasn't that important. That's sort of the, the whole thing behind the degree centrality. Um, remember the eigenvector centrality? I will talk about that later. Remember the word simply. Um, so. What happens with uh, the degree centrality? And why is it, and, and what can it tell us about the whole point I'm trying to make? Well, one of the things that we also do when we start studying uh, historical networks is to try and compare them with what social scientists have told us for decades that a uh, standard human network should look like. In the sense that if I reconstruct this kind of network from my sources, and when compared to what a usual a standard social network among humans should look like, I have similar things. That means that uh, it, it makes sense to make the comparison. Uh, uh, I mean, that is probably something there. But what happens if the network I'm reconstructing uh, is very unlike what it, a normal standard human network should look like? Then it means I have a problem. I need to look at my data because something's happening. So I'm simplifying this very much, but I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping you're following what I'm saying. So um, I'm studying in particular three groups, the three religious movements that were contemporary, that shared the time and space that they are developed in the early 14th century. And they were um, um, brought before inquisitors in the early 14th century, uh, convicted also in the early 14th century in the region of, of Languedoc. So the first one, the late Cathars, uh, that was the largest uh, network I worked with. I'm talking about about 800 individuals with about 8,000 connections between them. And uh, that's the one I'm gonna use to, to make this particular point. So let's look at what is called the degree distribution. So um, please don't, don't be afraid because I'm gonna use a bit of math, but uh, it will be harmless, I promise. So um, we have, this is what is called the degree distribution. What is it showing? Basically, it's telling us that most of the people, here is the number of actors, have very few connections, maybe one people, one other person, two people, three people, but then there are a few that have an enormous uh, number of connections. Um, what, does the, what does this mean? It means, and, and what I was saying, that probably these people here See here, for example, this individual, just one, has 369 mentions in the records. That probably means that these individuals here with this huge number of connections were used at some point as heresy markers. Their names were prompted by the inquisitor during the questions, where most of the community was here. The blue line here is just to show you what a standard uh, human network should look like. It picks quickly 
And then it is what we call in maths, heavy tail, the means it's um, decaying exponentially anyway. So uh, the distribution of late gathers basically uh, approximates quite reasonably what a standard social network, human social network uh, would, mm, would look like. So another property of this kind of networks is that if we separate part of the sample, the whole structure should hold. So let's separate the sample. Let's look at men on, one, on the one hand and women on the other. So first, the men. If we look at this, we have basically the same distribution. So it's still happening. It's peaking uh, rapidly and then it's decaying exponentially. So everything seems to work. What happens when we look at women? And when we look at women, I mean, it's pretty obvious that something's happening. Uh, we don't have the same distribution. We have a very huge gap here where we should have a lot more data. So this is something else that bugs the hypothesis that women were underrepresented in these records. And we cannot reconstruct a network uh, where women uh, are represented as they should be if this was a standard human network. So um, what can we do? I mean, can we solve this in any way? Um, of course, social network analysis is not magic. It cannot help us uh, fill this void. I mean, if women were underrepresented, we cannot make up those women. But what it can help us with is uh, using different measures of centrality to see what kind of roles women were uh, adopting in these networks and where uh, we can expect to find women that have remained unseen, these hidden voices I was talking about in the, in the title. So uh, now I'll move to another group. These were uh, way less numerous. Uh, we're talking about 200 individuals, more or less, and 1,100 connections. Um, so these were the begins of Languedoc uh, that also shared the space and time with late gathers that were fairly new. Actually, we could say, uh, simplifying things again, that the begins be became heretics overnight. And they were a very new heresy on late gathers. So um, I'm going to talk about a woman in particular who is doesn't seem to be very special in in the you know in the whole thing, but um, that can show us what I was trying to to point out. So what we know of Armasenda uh, comes from her own deposition. Nobody else mentions her. She was a woman who lived in this town here in Gignac, and she was a widow who had been married to Joan Castanier uh, from the neighboring town of Lodec. Please note that I'm using the, my native Catalan pronunciation for the names. That's why I've written them down to, so they wouldn't get lost in, in, in translation or pronunciation, should I say. Um, so uh, probably by 1305, Hermesenda was already a widow and she took a vow of chastity, which was a common practice among her group. Um, which I haven't said, but they were really linked to radical Franciscanism in this early 14th century. So we know, the next thing we know about her is that before 1318, she went to Narbonne to celebrate the major feast for this community, which was a celebration of the anniversary of the death of who would be her, their sort of spiritual master and uncanonized saint, the famous Franciscan theologian, Piero Giannolini. We know this was before 1318, because the tomb was destroyed in 1318 and therefore the feast was not celebrated there uh, anymore. Uh, it was celebrated in other places. So there she probably met Raymond de Juan who was a Franciscan uh, who would later be um, considered an apostate Franciscan and persecuted by the inquisitors too. Uh, later after 1318, we find her in an indulgence and in that was being preached. And there we know that she knew one of the four Franciscans that were burned at the stake in 1318, which was sort of a very seminal movement, uh, moment for the movement, it was like a turning point. So later on, before 1325, we find her in Montpellier in what I like to call the Bonetta household. This was a house that was shared by three sisters and uh, their companion, Alaraxis, in a sort of spiritual community. This, one, this woman here, Naprose Boneta, was just the woman uh, I was mentioning as an exception, and I've been talking to people around here over the past two weeks about her. She was the woman who claimed that she was the, the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, so she was a very special case. Anyway, Ermesenda was there, so she knew the whole household. And later on, 
we find her in uh, her sentence in Carcassonne in 1328, uh, where we discover that she probably was the one who denounced her friend Sibylla Caselli, another uh, widow from Guinea. So this is sort of the story uh, of Ermesenda. And if we continue, uh, we can trace, we can map what is called as her ego network. That means the connection, the people connected directly to Ermesenda. And we get this very simple network. Um, so um, green for men, uh, red for women. So uh, this was sort of the network of the people directly connected to Ermesenda and the connections between them. So now let's look at the case of another man who had a similar degree centrality. That means someone who was also modestly connected as is Ermesenda. This is a very modest ego network. So let's see what happens with a man that had sort of the same situation. So the man is called Beira Dort, and uh, as with Ermesenda, we can reconstruct part of his history. Uh, we know that she was, he was from Montreal and uh, his father was called Mateo. And later on, also before 1318, we find him in Narbonne doing exactly the same thing as Ermesenda, where he met Beira Dunors and Beira Rufat, two other men that were also related to the network. After that, we find him in Bézier, uh, 1320, 1321, where he attended a general sermon where uh, many co-religionists, many members of this network were burned. That was also a common practice among the Begans of Languedoc. They attended each other's executions. Well, uh, no, not each other's because, well, you know what I mean. Uh, they attended executions and that was a community binding event for them because they sort of witnessed the, the martyrdom of, of, their, of their friends and, um, and companions. So after that, um, we find him west trying to avoid the inquisitorial persecution in the villages of Belpeche and saint Gabel, where he met all these people and where Guillaume Ross ended up denouncing him. He was captured and finally um, his sentence to life imprisonment was pronounced in, in Pamir in 1322. So when we look at his ego network, we have basically the same as in the case of Ermesenda, a relatively modest ego network, again, men and women. What happens when we compare the two of them? So uh, just to make it more visually appealing, here we have them. So these networks are very much alike. So their degree centralities, that means how many people mentioned, how, how many people were directly connected to them are basically the same. Then what is the whole point of this thing? The whole point of this, of this thing is that we use another uh, centrality measure and that was the eigenvector centrality I was telling you before please remember this. So this eigenvector centrality, what does it do? It's not uh, how many people are you connected to. It's how well connected are the people you are connected to. To put it simply, if you are connected to 100 people, but those people are kept to themselves and don't have many other connections, your, uh, your eigenvector will be lower than if you were connected to three people, but those three people were extremely well connected, like celebrity-like connected. That's what I mean. Why your eigenvector is higher? What does it mean that your eigenvector is higher? It means that you can influence the network much more than if your eigenvector was lower. Because although you have a fewer connections, those are very important connections that can spread wherever you have to say or wherever you have to give much more rapidly than if you had uh, lots of connections but uh, with people that were themselves um, not very well connected. I'm hoping I'm making myself clear. The thing is that Ermesenda Rosa, when we take into account her eigenvector uh, centrality, ranks very, very high. Why? Because two of her connections, Raimonda Joan, the Franciscan I was telling you about, and Naprose Boneta, the woman who claimed to be the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, were themselves extremely central in the whole network. And that meant that, hypothetically, anything that Ermesenda would have, have, would have wanted to share with the whole network would be easily spread. And the opposite is also true. She would receive news and things uh, that were circulating through the network. And I'm using things with quotation marks because anything you can think of uh, can be considered something that circulates through the network. She would potentially receive it where, way uh, sooner than Beta Dor, who, when we take into account his eigenvector centrality, ranks very, very low. So these two people who were uh, basically equally connected uh, rank very differently when we take into account the eigenvector centrality. But the thing is that that happens with most women. Most women, even those who have a degree centrality, 
uh, a moderate to modest degree centrality. When we look at eigenvector centralities, women go way up, men go way down. So women were less mentioned in the records, but they were very uh, well connected. They were connected to people that was in one way or another central to the network. That's one of the things that network analysis can help us see. And to conclude this whole presentation, I'll just bring uh, uh, up another, the third group uh, I've been working with, and that is the old engines that were also uh, convicted in these same uh, inquisitorial processes. And I'm bringing this up to show you something else that we can do with these networks, but also to uh, answer a question that sometimes people pose, well, we can only use social networks if we have very, very large numbers. For example, the 700 cathars I was talking about, the 200, almost 300, the guns I was talking about. What happens when we have very uh, few people, a very small network? Can we use social network analysis then? Well, the thing is that the numbers you will get, the quantitative analysis will be much less accurate, but that doesn't mean that the whole methodology cannot help us look towards um, important gaps or things that we need to explore further or things that are maybe not so much as we thought they were. And that's what I want to prove with this very, very um, brief case. We have this hub of world engines, uh, two men, two women. Um, the, this is a very, very simplified graph, please indulge me. It was just that this was the very end of the talk and I thought they'll be super tired of hearing me talk and seeing graphs, let's put this very simply. So uh, this graph we see, uh, again, men in green, women in red, and the relative size of the dots depends on how important these people were, how central, how influential in uh, the conventional terms. So these four people are the only old engines interrogated in the Fournier register, one of the sources I showed you before. And when we look at the uh, interrogations and the register in a conventional way, we should say, uh, it seems that Raymond de Costa was super important because he was a priest in the movement. Jean Fustier was also important, although he was a layman. Ugeta was Jean's uh, wife and Agnes had been uh, Raymond's uh, wet nurse when, when he was a kid. Um, but the important one is Raymond, and the women are basically uh, secondary uh, actors in the whole thing. What happens when we look at it from the relational approach? For starters, let's look at all the people involved in the whole thing. So we get a moderate size network of about 60 people or so. Again, uh, men in uh, green, women in red. And the sizes have changed uh, considerably because then we realized that Ugeta was very well connected. And uh, there were lots of people that knew her and she knew a lot of people. So for starters, there's this change in size. Then uh, many of the men here, I have to say, were not uh, laymen. They were the priestly elite of the movement, the equivalent to a priest for world engines. So what is the operation that we can make here? I was uh, just saying that the centrality measures do not apply as well here because the network is too small. But there's something else we can do with this data. We can do what is called node filtering, which means basically removing one actor and seeing what happens to the network. Of course, when we remove an actor, anybody that's only connected to, the nat to that actor also goes away. So let's do this. Let's remove Raymond de Costa, who was supposedly the most important person in this hub. So when we remove him, the resulting network is this, one. it is this one, which is basically the same network as the other one, just smaller as we could have expected. It's the same components, but smaller. So what happens if we remove Fugeta instead of Raimon? If we remove her, the network has changed completely. Why? Most women have disappeared, for starters. But not only that, there's a um, piece of information I haven't given you, but uh, most of these are priests. So um, the problem when we remove Ugeta is that we are removing most women and we are removing the laity. So in other words, if there's no Ugeta, the movement is basically priests, priests, world engine priests. I mean, the equivalent to world engine priests. So what can we say about Ugeta? Ugeta was very well connected, but what was her role in the whole thing? She was not only supporting the network uh, in, in, in terms of food and or shelter, which is something that has been usually attributed to the female roles in dissident networks. She was a broker. 
She was a broker that was facilitating access to the priestly elite. She was um, convincing people of Waldensian doctrines and also bringing them to receive uh, sacraments administered by these Waldensian elite. So that's also some of the things that uh, network analysis can help us do and can help us uh, see about women that we wouldn't be able to see with a more conventional approach. So finally, I would be remiss if I uh, didn't end with a caveat. I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. That is to say, am I saying that uh, networks are uh, the solution to everything, that we can solve everything in uh, religious history just using networks and recovering all these hidden voices? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that to the conventional traditional approach that is absolutely vital source criticism is still the cornerstone and should be of historical research. We should add other methods that help us identify where uh, we need to make more questions. That's what I'm saying. And now to end, I'm gonna paraphrase a uh, um, fellow resident of the Center for the Study of World Religions, a Christian Greer just last week, he said, the job of the historian of religion is not to fill in the gaps, but to explain them. Uh, I'm going to rephrase that. I hope that's OK. The job of the historian of medieval religion is not to fill in the gaps, but to find them in the first place and to understand the context that resulted in those gaps. So um, I hope that makes sense. And I'm so looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Delphi. And let's um, give her a round of, of applause. Um, the amount of work that has gone into this is absolutely <laughs> awesome uh, in, in the literal sense. Um, while P I am going to ask a question while um, you all are, are thinking about what you would like to ask Delphi and putting your questions into the chat so that I can read them or call on you. Um, but Delphi, I, this is, it's so challenging to speak to an audience like this, which includes people um, who can tell you the difference between a Waldensian and a Cathar and a Beguine very easily, and people who may be hearing these terms for the first time. That was um, a challenge. So um, I wonder if for both groups, you would be willing to say something for us about um, how we will understand the, the textual scholarship differently after this additional method has been added. What, what difference is it going to make in our interpretation of medieval Christianity and medieval heresies? Well, um... To put it simply, and that was sort of the, the whole idea that um, actually I have to say, this was not what I was expecting from the results of my dissertation, to be honest. Uh, my idea was to basically uh, study how uh, these different groups organize themselves, what were the structural features, and could we say something different from a new heresy than from an old heresy. And even in the case of Waldensians, they were, these particular Waldensians had all migrated for Burgund, from Burgundy. So there was also the component of the origin there. So that was my goal. And then I started seeing weird things like what's happening with women? Um, should, shouldn't there be more women here? Why are they not? And then uh, of course, and here it's the, the, the training and the background helps. Uh, I have to say I'm a physicist, I'm, I'm sorry, we all have a best. And we tend to look for patterns and um, maths sometimes are useful for real life and even for history. And so I decided to look at it from that perspective. Can we do some quantitative um, study with this and see what, what's happening? And what I saw was basically confirming what I had thought could be the problem. And I also um, looked at the fact, uh, I was talking about heresy markers and we can also see, and that's also something that I uh, dealt with in the dissertation, but what I'm, I'm trying to do even more now, that some of these people um, are not heresy markers from the beginning. They appear at some point for some different reasons. And that's also something that bugs up the whole conclusion. So what, um, to answer your question, um, uh, to put it um, shortly, which I never do, but um, the thing is that 
what we can see is that I'm not saying, for example, in the last in the last case I showed, I'm not saying that Raimondo Costa was not important. He was, but Ugeta was too. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not that what we've learned so far was all wrong, not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't have done what I've done without what has been done so far, but we can do more. That's what I'm saying. And especially that's uh, important for the study of women in religion because the victims, so to speak, of these biases I'm talking about, the main um, group to be damaged and to be distorted in a way uh, have been women. And not only because they, uh, not about the number, it's not about the number, it's about their roles, uh, their leadership roles. I'm talking about how is it possible in a context where um, allegedly women were not supposed to be leaders that we found someone as Nabros Boneta. And um, I'm looking at Luisa Barnum, who's here, and I know we share this fascination with Prose. Um, she's the only person called a heresiar, a master of heretics, in the um, trials against almost 200 people. So uh, how is it possible if women were not leaders, if their contribution was not intellectual or doctrinal whatsoever? What's more, these were supposed to be illiterate women. That means they didn't have Latin. They didn't read or write Latin, most of them. But still, how is it possible that they were so vital in the spread of religious dissent? That's sort of the question I'm, that's leading the whole project that, I'm, that I'll be conducting next year. So that's it, basically. I don't think that we need to um, contest everything we've learned. We just need to add to it, to build on it. That's sort of the point I was trying to make. Great. Well, I have lots more questions, but while um, people are putting their questions in the chat, um, I'm going to um, read a question from your sister colleague in the WSRP, uh, Zat, who's here today. And she asks, um, a lot of your work contends with uncertainty, especially in tracing these elusive nodes. How do you mitigate the tension between both certainty and uncertainty in archival work in your own research? That's actually um, a very uh, good question. You've put your finger on that. Um, I think that this is a question that any historian, medieval historian in the room could answer. Because despite my background as a physicist, and I say despite, um, in the end, I have to deal with the same sources, with unfragmented, uh, uh, sorry, with fragmented information that you have to pick up very slowly, very painstakingly to build up a whole narrative. And that's exactly what I'm doing, that any other medievalist in the room, and I would dare to say any other historian in the room, uh, pre-modern historian, uh, has exactly the same problem. So it's, um, it's a great question for all of us, but uh, I would like to say, and I know that this is not what Zad was saying, but sometimes uh, we people who work on historical network analysis are asked this question uh, by other fellow medievalists saying, hey, but you don't know the whole uh, network. Well, my aim was never to reconstruct the whole thing. It was only to shed light on what we know. And uh, to be more specific about what Zad was asking. Um, let's say that um, next year someone finds a cache of documents with all the laws, the position of the communities of Begans that have never been found uh, until now. Would that mean that Ermesenda would have less potential to influence her network? No, it wouldn't. It would just mean that we have more information about the rest of the network. But that would not mean that what we already know is not correct. And that's the only way to deal with that uncertainty because in the end, I haven't gone into this because as Anne said, this is a very mixed audience. And I mean, I could be talking about this for, for ages. And, but inquisitorial records in themselves are, have lots of issues, not only regarding women, but in general, because for starters, they are a totally unbalanced dynamic of power. I mean, it's not the same as a, sociologist uh, uh, asking someone if they like um, avocados. I mean, this is about someone uh, in a very hostile environment, removed from their social framework and facing people who speak in another language 
um, with a result on which depends everything, including your life. So for starters, that needs to make us think about the whole uh, dynamic of the interrogation. So, but we could say, uh, can we ever um, overcome the fact that we are getting to these hidden voices through the voices of their persecutors? And that's the question, but I like to think we can somehow, maybe not everything, of course, never everything, but there are hints at, at what these people really felt, even through Latin, even through the multiple translations that the whole record uh, suffered before it ended up in our hands. Still, there are some things that are unequivocally their own, and that's sort of the magic of what we do, trying to find out what it is that was their own. So I don't know if I've answered that, but it's a very delicate dance. Uh, we suddenly have a raft of questions, and we just have about another five minutes. So I'm actually going to pick a question from Claire Taylor who asks, um, aren't medieval clergy supposed to be woman haters rather than indifferent to women? Wouldn't they have had a tendency to play up the bad influence of women? And they being led by an indifference to women's role on the part of the male dissidents they identified. Um, and I, you know, this makes me think of probably one of the few documents of the Inquisition that's read by American historians, which is the Malleus Maleficarum, which makes this case that women are prone to heresy. Well, um, um, both things are true. So um, as Claire perfectly knows, of course, um, women were thought to be, to find heresy more appealing. Women were dangerous because they talk a lot. Um, they keep talking about things. Plus they are super gullible, they believe anything. So they hear these horrible heretical errors and they repeat them all around. But are they the, um, how do you call it? The mastermind behind the whole thing? Never, mm. that's sort of the point. So, um, and I've also worked on this because I have like um, uh, an article in the making about um, gender strategies in front of the inquisitors. And um, sort of the result is that inquisitors actually um, granted women some degree of agency, but just in this sense, never intellectually. And actually um, in the records, we find women saying, no, I believe this because women are so gullible, we believe anything. And the question is, did they, or was this a strategy uh, like playing dumb? I mean, uh, we've done that. I, I know I, I have. So um, wouldn't you in front of the inquisitor so it's not like um, this bias against women. Uh, inquisitors thought women were more likely to spread heresy, but again, never as instigators themselves, never as the mastermind, always as followers that basically like parrots repeated what they heard and believed. And I, I, we could talk way more about this, Claire, and you know it, but let's leave it there. Well, we have a whole group of fascinating questions here. Um, that we aren't going to have time to go into. Um, I do, I'm going to ask Tracy to put into the chat our schedule of uh, further lectures for the semester. I hope to see many of you um, at some of the, the projects, mm -hmm. project and reports if, coming if, from our if other. If I may, um, I'm just seeing a question by, by Sean, I think it's Sean Field. Um, that I would like to answer if I can, because it's, it's really something I haven't had the chance to say in my presentation. It's just a minute, I promise. And then I'll I was go. absolutely going to give you the last word, Delphi. Okay. Like any <laughs> any final makes, thoughts a, that you have, the floor is yours. He makes a really good point. He says, as you said, Rose Bonetta would be a rare example of a woman, of a woman in heretical group who was obviously important. So does network theory tell us something by showing that she was important in previously unknown ways? Yes. Because um, when you look at the ego network, hi Sean, when you look at the ego network of Naprose, when compared to other ego networks of people who were in similar positions within her movement, I'm talking about Peda Trencavel and all his, um, you know, uh, his gang. Um, actually, they were just as well connected as her, but the networks are different. And Napro's network could be compared to networks uh, that I think would be more consistent with a sort of charismatic thing. 
the networks where uh, these very important men in the movement were central were networks based on the survival of the movement, on circulating news, on um, circulating food, circulating books, that sort of thing. But in a process network was a, a different structure that we can say, and, and we can talk more about this and, and some other point, we can say it's a different structure. It is a, a, a charismatic structure. It's someone that attracts people because people that already know each other, but either way, they go to her because of her charisma is a completely different structure from the point of view of social networks. So yes, absolutely. It, uh, anyway, it's fascinating. Well, thank you so much for that last comment um, and also for the suggestion that we play dumb in front of the inquisitors. I well, know. I've done so in front of the police. Oh, this is being recorded. Uh, <laughs> you know, fines, so sort of thing. Oh, I didn't realize there was, yeah. I think the inquisition is over. I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this fascinating presentation. Um, and thank you so much to Delphi for sharing this really stimulating research and for getting us rolling with a great conversation for the semester. Well, thank you all for coming, really. Thank you all. Fond farewell to all the, the friends out there and a, a big hand to Delphi. Sponsor, Women's Studies in Religion Program. Copyright 2021, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.